Park Ridge Community Church. Welcome to 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 worship at the Park Ridge Community Church. I'm Sasha Gerritsen, Director of Music Ministries, and we are so glad that you're here with us today, where all are welcome. Before we begin our time of worship, I have just a few announcements for the life of our congregation. As we continue our remote-only worship experience, please remember to connect with our church family, either through one-on-one -on -one phone calls, texts, through kindred connection groups, Bible study, or reaching out to some of your friends. The importance of connecting with one another is amplified when we can't meet face to face. We are grateful for your efforts in this regard. And we are still receiving pledges for 2021. With all that being said, let us turn our hearts and minds to the worship of God. in body or in spirit and join together in a call to worship. Come, let us return to the one who calls us into community. For surely I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. We give thanks that God plans for our welfare, giving us a future with hope. Let us remember whose we are. We are one body, one planet, one church. We remember God's promise and sing the song of gladness. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. I invite you to quiet your mind, take a deep breath in, as we find rest for our souls in God's embrace. 
And now let us pray together our prayer of confession. God of steadfast love, you have pursued us and loved us with wild abandon, and we have responded by turning away. When we have lost all hope, you have continued to invite us to new endeavors. We continue to allow our doubts and fears to quell our faith. We have forgotten our identity as your beloved. We have refused to recognize our brothers and sisters as your children. We lament the ways that we have allowed walls of difference to divide us. Remove the walls we have constructed, create in us clean hearts, and renew your spirit within us. Hear this promise of God toward his people. If you seek me with your hearts, you will find me. Call to me and I will restore you and heal your wounds. God hears us, forgives us, and makes us whole. Thanks be to God. Amen. offer one another a sign of peace. Over the next few moments, you'll see members of our congregation and friends reaching out in the loving peace of Jesus Christ to you and to all. This week, we hope you will connect with your friends in offering them the peace of Christ. May the peace of our Lord be with you all. Peace, peace be, be with, with you. you. Peace, peace be with, with you. you. Peace be with you. And also with you. And also with you. And also with you. Our first reading today comes from Jeremiah 32, verses 1 through 3 and 6 through 15. Hear these words. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of King Zedekiah of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and the prophet Jeremiah was confined in the court of the guard, that was in the palace of the king of Judah, where King Zedekiah of Judah had confined him. Zedekiah had said, Why do you prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord, I am going to give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Hanamel, son of your uncle Shalom, is going to come to you and say, Buy my field that is at Anathoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then my cousin Hanamel came to me in the court of the guard, in accordance with the word of the Lord, and said to me, Buy my field that is at Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord, and I bought the field at Anathoth from my cousin Hanamel, and weighed out the money to him, seventeen shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase, containing the terms and conditions, and the open copy. And I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Nariah, son of Messiah, in the presence of my cousin Hanamel, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase. 
and in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. In their presence, I charged Baruch, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, God of Israel, Take these deeds, both the sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware jar, in order that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. Hey PRCC kids, it is so good to be with you another week, no matter where you are right now. Have you ever been caught in a storm before? Perhaps on a boat? I remember one time I was with some family members out in the Gulf of Mexico off of the coast of Galveston, Texas. It was my first time on a boat out in the big open waters. I was a little nervous, didn't really know what to expect. But the weather was absolutely beautiful. The sun was out, the sky was so blue, and the wind was so calm. So as we started going along the water, in the far distant, I could see some kind of gray clouds lurking. And as time went by, those gray clouds got closer and closer, and the wind got stronger and stronger. And then all of a sudden, it began to rain. And all of a sudden, the wind really started to blow. The boat started to tip sideways, and I was so scared that we were just going to completely tip over. My friend and I grabbed on to each other. We reached for life jackets and strapped them on. You should always put your life jacket on before the boat leaves the shore. So I asked the captain, are we going to sink? Is this boat going to make it? I was terrified. I had no experience on boats, no experience navigating through these rough waters. But the captain remained calm and he looked at us and said, don't worry, I got it. Everything is going to be okay. I trusted him in that moment. And guess what? Everything was okay. Things were a little scary along the way and I wasn't quite sure how it was gonna turn out. But his peaceful presence, his calm made me calm. Asking the question in my fear and in my anxiety being able to say it out loud, knowing that my question and my fears and my anxieties were heard by the captain, allowed me to find peace. When the winds come and life just seems to be all shaken up and chaotic, we ask out, we cry out to God, are we going to make it? So it doesn't have to be a literal storm that we're in the middle of. Maybe it's something hard that you're going through or your family is going through. Maybe it's a subject in school. Maybe a loved one is not feeling well. Whatever it may be, we can cry out to Jesus and say, do something. Jesus will grant us peace. Jesus will calm the storms. We can find comfort in Jesus. And guess what? I wasn't alone on that boat. And the disciples in the scripture today weren't alone. They had each other. Just like I have you and you have us as the church. Together, we will help navigate the storm. We'll help raise our sails so we can sail to calmer waters. I hope that you are able to cry out and to ask for peace. No matter what storm you may be going through right now. 
We delight in the fact that we are a faith community who prays for and cares for each other. We share each other's celebrations, and we take care of each other in the challenges that life has for us. This week we have a number of celebrations and we have a number of prayers to bring before you. We celebrate birthdays, including today, Kim Donkey, and on the 18th we celebrate Bev Pat and Ryan Desmond's birthdays. On the 20th, we celebrate Wendy Hayes, and on Saturday, we have a number of birthdays, including Josh Jarvis, Marie Clapper, and Karen Swanson. It is a joy to celebrate each of you. We are so grateful for who you are in our lives. Our friends Ronald and Arlen celebrated their wedding anniversary this past week. They were married right here in our sanctuary 31 years ago by former senior minister Doug Reynolds. It's a joy to celebrate that long-term love with them. We also hold in our prayers the world as in places that are experiencing hurricanes and tropical storms resulting in flooding such as is occurring in Honduras and mudslides in Guatemala. We pray for those all affected by extreme weathers and what that means to their world. Prayers continue for those affected by the coronavirus, those in the medical field caring for the sick, those in the scientific community who are working on treatments and vaccines, those grieving the loss of loved ones, as well as those who are home sick recovering from the virus. That includes our own family of the Hills, including Pastor Carol, Adrian, their three children, and her aunts who are staying with them right now. We pray for them for rest, healing, patience, as they slowly make their way back to full and restored health. We continue to hold Bill Z in our prayers as he is now home from the hospital and he, Luann, and his medical team figure out ways to care for the latest struggles with his lungs. Please continue to pray for Mike A as he heals from last week's hip replacement surgery. Kathy S. requests prayers for her granddaughter, Anna, who went to the Mayo Clinic for an extensive workup to try to seek a clear diagnosis. Please pray for hope, encouragement, and relief from the pain that Anna is suffering. We also ask for prayers for Lorenzo F.'s mom, Constance, who is back in the hospital and had surgery on Monday. She remains in critical condition. Diane M. asks for prayers for her friend, Joe, who had emergency surgery last week and was diagnosed with colon cancer. Please pray for his recovery from surgery and for all that is ahead for he and his family. We also pray for Jacqueline W's mom, mother-in-law, Linda, who was hospitalized with a number of health complications, some of which have been resolved and others of which remain. She is also in intensive care. Please hold all of these in your prayers, as well as those people who we haven't named specifically. And now let us go to God in prayer. Loving God, we come before you in faith, knowing you are the source of our blessed assurance. You are our creator God, redeeming savior, divine advocate. When the storms of life overwhelm us, when the winds of chaos and division blow, when waves of despair and uncertainty seem to overtake us, we approach you as your beloved children, born of your divine spirit. And so as your covenant people, we come before you in thanksgiving for who you are in our lives. Thank you for allowing us to yoke ourselves with you as we shoulder the burdens of this world. And thank you for the gift of prayer whispers of love that we offer now. We pray for ourselves, for our hearts to align with yours, for our minds to be reminded of your presence always, and for our strength and our entire beings to abide with you. We pray for each other. 
We pray for all of those who have been named here, including the Hell family, Bill, Mike, Anna, Constance, Joe, and Linda. We pray for these dear ones, as well as all of those whose names are written on our hearts. We ask that you are with each one in the middle of the storm. Bring them hope, healing, and the peace that goes beyond our human understanding. We pray for our world, for healing and recovery from this COVID pandemic, for the calming of the literal storms that are happening all over the globe, and for unity in our own nation. We pray that in the midst of the turmoil and the uncertainties that we each can recognize that there are moments, too, of joys, of triumphs, of special celebrations. We thank you for all of these times. We thank you for the comforting routine of the changing seasons and for the place that you have in our lives. As the, as the disciples did in the middle of their storm so long ago, we now turn to our Savior Jesus and pray in the way he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verses 22 through 25. Hear the word of the Lord. One day he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they put out, and while they were sailing, he fell asleep. A windstorm swept down on the lake, and the boat was filling with water, and they were in danger. They went to him and woke him up, shouting, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he woke up and rebuked the wind and the raging waves. They ceased, and there was a calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? They were afraid and amazed and said to one another, Who then is this, that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I encourage you to watch the do-it-yourself Bible study this week if you want to learn a little bit more about the prophet Jeremiah. A priest's 
kid who's called as a teenager to preach hard things to all the political regimes that come and go over the next 40 years, this calling of Jeremiah's was not an easy one. He had to preach that the kingdom would fall, that they would be destroyed and the people would be living in exile. He called out corruption in politics and duplicitousness among the religious insiders. I'm not actually sure he had any friends other than his secretary, Baruch. But at one point, near the end of his ministry, near the end of King Zedekiah's reign, Jeremiah is told to buy a field. Now, this isn't just any field. This is the family land in the region of Anathoth where he had grown up. His cousin was looking to get rid of it, and Jeremiah had the first right of refusal or the right of redemption, paying for the land before it went up for public auction. Now that might, on the surface level, sound like a pretty good idea. Go ahead, purchase the family property, until you realize that the Babylonians were currently occupying said property. The forces were literally camped out on that field in Anathoth, getting ready to come in and destroy, laying siege to Jerusalem. The hope for a future, to have grapes that could grow on any vineyard there or any crop to harvest, is long gone. Anyone with half a brain would not buy that particular field because it's frankly a battlefield. But Jeremiah the prophet, who was called to preach very hard things to the nations for decades and decades, was instructed to buy this field. For God had a future in mind, and it was time to start buying property. The message this time was that God's people would again build homes. They would plant vineyards and harvest crops. This sounds pretty normal, kind of a typical Bible-y kind of message that comes from God, except this was a far cry from what Jeremiah typically preached. This message, and in fact the literal deed, spoke of a future with hope in the middle of a war. Jeremiah is not the happy-go-lucky preacher. He's the weeping prophet. And this message is one that he should and we will take to heart. He bought the field and he made sure that the details were tidy and official, sealed for future generations. After all, we know Jeremiah himself wouldn't see that future, but he did ensure that the next generation could. Jeremiah exhibits an outrageous faith in the middle of the storms of life, and he left a legacy of faith for all who would follow. I wonder if Jeremiah knew in that moment that he wouldn't get to see that future. I have a feeling that he must have experienced a whole range of emotions when he got that message that his cousin was coming to give him the right of purchase to that property and in fact that he should buy it. I wonder if he felt relief or hope, joy, maybe fear and doubt, uncertainty that maybe he was getting his wires uh, crossed, that maybe God wasn't calling him to do just that. But I think perhaps he felt exhilarated. Finally, finally, it's not bad news. God is faithful and there will be an end to the devastation and pain and sadness. I wonder if he could close his eyes and envision himself working the land, the land he had known all his life, personally getting to see the cities rebuilt. Or maybe he knew it wasn't his future, but the future for the next generation. Maybe he knew his part was to purchase the land and someone down the line would be there working it. I think that Anathoth became, for the prophet Jeremiah, a field of dreams. Even at the exact moment when he purchased it, 
It was a field of nightmares. Seeing beyond what's immediately apparent is a gift of faith. It's sometimes a practice of faith and it takes practice indeed. Have I, as I've navigated my own painful seasons in life, whether losing a loved one or moving across the country or having to start over or having my entire family become sick at the same time, I can attest it's not always easy to, oh, just have faith, this isn't the end. But even when it's hard, our faith helps us to see beyond the present moment. In this present moment, we have numbers of COVID cases skyrocketing. And while other places around the world, numbers are declining here in this nation, more and more people are getting sick, hospitals are filling up. And even so, God is at work, inspiring doctors, scientists, and lab technicians. Volunteers have come forward offering to participate in trials for vaccines. And we believe there will be a day when we can safely resume life together. Our faith can lift us up, even when the circumstances are bleak. In the present moment, we have high school students who think it's acceptable to verbally and physically abuse a fellow student because he's gay. Then additional students felt it was prudent to circulate the video of this child being beaten around social media. Homophobia, hatred, and intolerance are the legacies that our society has continued to pass along to our children. When the Supreme Court passed marriage equality so that same gender loving persons could be married and enjoy the same legal protections as straight couples, it would have been great if that had solved the problem of discrimination and injustice. And yet, our prejudice and our sin is enduring. And yet, our faith can lift us up, even when the circumstances are bleak. In this present moment, we find it easier to acquiesce to the powers of empire, greed, extortion, stockpiling of weapons and power, crafting alliances for profit rather than moral alignment. We find ourselves calculating cost-benefit scenarios, always seeking to be on the winning side, and the powers of bigotry, Racism that is pervasive, jokes that go unchecked, might is right, always mentality, addiction and mental illness on the rise. Where do we go from here? Where is the way out? What are the solutions? And yet, our faith can lift us up, even when circumstances are bleak. It seems that there are storms brewing on just about every front. And like those disciples that got into the boat with Jesus, who were pretty sure they were making the right call, we too second guess ourselves. We question whether or not faith is enough. We question whether or not we have faith at all. We wonder if the waves and the thunder and the lightning are just actually too much, God could not actually overcome each of these. We wonder where Jesus has gone in the moments when we need him the most. Jesus, are you asleep? We find ourselves in need of a savior. Where are you? And it's almost as if it was Jesus waiting for us to open our eyes, saying exactly, we are in need of a savior and he's been here all along, ready to help, ready to help sheer, steer the ship and we wouldn't get out of the way. Our present storm of COVID is swamping the ship. Jesus urges us to stay calm, to be safe, to surround those who are struggling the ways that this church community has shown up for me and my family this past week has left me speechless. 
The power of COVID doesn't stand a chance against the strength of Jesus' love embodied in this community. Our present storm of hatred against the LGBTQ community is swamping the ship. Jesus urges us to find calm. He's already called a number of people to come together to live out Jesus' love that is reflected in all loving relationships. Jesus is already steering us in ways to help clarify who we are as a church and allow that to help our community lead the way in having hard conversations that can ultimately help our students, our young people, our middle-aged people, and our older generations all come to terms with how we care for one another, not allowing our past understandings our past bigotry and hate to lead the way, but instead to allow love to rule the day. We can celebrate differences. We can honor the beauty of God's creation in every person, regardless and because of the beauty of the diversity of sexual orientation and gender identities. The power of hate doesn't stand a chance against the strength of Jesus' love embodied in this community. Our present storms of greed and self-centeredness, all of the isms that seem to be taking a hold of our world is swamping the ship. Are those forces threatening the ways that we work together to build community? Jesus urges us to find the calm. Jesus reminds us of the importance of sharing, of reaching out, of looking for the least and the last, the most vulnerable among us, and care for them first. Jesus calls us to live out radical love and to never give up. Keep finding new ways to reach out. And we discover in the process the power of greed, the power of independence and self-sustaining doesn't stand a chance against the strength of Jesus' love that binds us together to one another. Our scriptures convey our faith, and our faith teaches us that even in the middle of life's storms, we can turn to Jesus. He's always there. He's already there helping to see us through. These verses and these scripture lessons remind me of the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. The first verse that says, When peace like a river attendeth my way, or when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. These words penned by Horatio Spafford after losing his business and investments in the Chicago fire and then losing his four daughters who had gone on a boat trip with their mother across the ocean to meet him in England. That ship was struck by an iron sailing vessel which killed all four of his daughters, leaving his wife as the remaining survivor along with him. Horatio got on board another ship to meet his wife in England. And as the waves rocked his ship to and fro, he grieved the loss of his life, the loss of the livelihood that he had known in Chicago, the loss of those four beautiful girls. And he wrote this hymn. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say it is well with my soul. The last verse of this hymn says, And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. As Christians, we have a future hope when Christ shall return. But our future hope isn't simply the coming of the eschaton, God's kingdom. 
Our hope is in the ever-living, ever-present God who does help our souls to be well even in the middle of life's storms. Like Jeremiah, our faith helps us to see through these storms of the present into the field of dreams. Dreams where God's will is done and all God's children can thrive and be well. Let this be a day when we dream God's dreams, when we demonstrate outrageous faith and step forward together, living out outrageous faith and outrageous love that conquers the storms of life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Even though we are apart, we are still together in our love of Jesus Christ. And our invitation to offering is as needed as ever was before. We invite you to consider how you can give back to the Lord through your offerings of time, talent, and treasure. If you would like to make a financial gift to support the ministries of Park Ridge Community Church, we invite you to do so via PayPal or Zelle giving at parkridgecommunitychurch.org, or you can mail a check into the church. Please consider your gifts as we bring them to the Lord.
And now let us join together in a prayer of thanksgiving. We give you thanks for the goodness and love that you have shown to us in Christ. Bless these gifts that they may be used to build the community of healing and reconciliation. Embolden us, O God, as people of your global village to trust that a new creation is possible. May our sharing be a symbol of that trust. Amen. We're so glad that you joined us for worship this day. Whether this is your first time with us at Park Ridge Community Church or you've been a longtime member, we're so glad that you have joined us and have worshiped with us this day. If we can be of any assistance to you, please reach out. We'd love to tell you more about our church or ways that you can be involved. I and all of our staff are here to support you in your spiritual journey, helping you navigate whatever storms you may find yourself in. Receive now this blessing and benediction. Before I formed you, I knew you. You have been created with love and with purpose. Go to live out your life, fulfilling God's dreams and feeling God's presence. No matter the storms, no matter the challenges, no matter the obstacles that we face, God is with us and Jesus' love will carry us through. Thanks be to God. Amen. God be with you.